I know that's a bit of a long bumper, but we wanted to give you a sampling of the prophets that we're going to be looking at. And so uh, each one of those verses that are up there is just a taste uh, of what we're going to be studying uh, the, over the next month and a half. Uh, as I get started, I, I want to share with you uh, my struggle as a high school student in studying God's Word. As a high school student, when I first started to study the Bible on my own, I, I think one of the most challenging obstacles that I faced was trying to figure out where to start. Right? Uh, as I started to read the, the Bible, I, I realized some things about myself. Right? If, if I started in the wrong place, my efforts to study God's Word would often be short-lived. Right? So if, if I started in a book of the Bible that was too long, or, or maybe it was too confusing for me, Despite my good intentions, my, my efforts to study the Bible would be short-lived. Uh, so over time, I, I developed a strategy. I decided that, uh, well, I realized rather that I did better when I read the short books. And so I, I, I started to read the short books of the New Testament, the epistles. Now, the epistles are letters written by the Apostle Paul, and, and they're, they're books like Ephesians. Philippians, Galatians. For the, for the men that were at the men's uh, meal last Thursday, the epistles are where Everett's taking us next. He's taking us into these short books of the New Testament that are just full of inspiration and, and, and insight. And so I found application from the epistles just easy to come across. It was like every time I opened God's word, uh, truth just kind of jumped out at me. It was like picking up gold nuggets off the ground and just sticking them in your pocket, right? It was, it was that easy. But over time, I, I started to want to venture into the Old Testament. And so, again, I had that same problem. Where, where do I start? Now, I had started in the past in, in Genesis and, and had fizzled out, and so I didn't want to start there again. And so I thought, I'm going to use my strategy from the New Testament. I'm going to read all the short books, and that decision took me to the backwater of the Bible, a place where there are 12 short books uh, known as the Minor Prophets. Now the Minor Prophets, they're called minor not because they lack importance, but because they're short. Right? They, they, they are just as important as Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and Daniel. Their message is just shorter. And so they're all kind of lumped together and, and, and referred to as the Minor Prophets. Uh, these short books, they are really different from the inspirational writings of the epistles, right? They, they are, they're just steeped in history. They, they expect you to know a lot of things. You, you have to know uh, Israel's history. You have to know their, their key leaders. You, you, you have to know place names. And so the epistles, or excuse me, the minor prophets are really different than the epistles. If the epistles are like picking gold nuggets up off the ground, well then... The minor prophets are like digging with a pickaxe. It is hard work, right? But it, it, this is the thing. If you, have the, if you can endure, right? If you're willing to do the work, there is a vein of truth that, that makes it well worth the, the effort. And so uh, this week we are starting a new series and we're going to spend the next six weeks looking at the minor prophets. Now, we're not going to be able to look at all 12, and so we've picked six that, that we will be looking at. And we're going to make it our goal to study each prophet, to kind of come to a, a basic understanding of the history that surrounds them, and then pull out a thread, right? Just a thread of truth that, that we can apply uh, to our lives. And so as we study these prophets, what we're going to discover is that the same struggles, the same temptations, the same weaknesses that plagued God's people thousands of years ago, still are remarkably similar to the same temptations and struggles and frustrations that we face today. And, and so in, in the series, we're going <laughs> to, excuse me, I was mark that as, avoid that paragraph. <laughs> Let's dig in. Uh, the, the minor prophets, they had a, a, an incredibly hard job, right? They were sent to God's people to give them a warning. That primarily, that's what their message is. It is a warning that, that judgment is coming. Now, at the time, this time in Israel's history, the nation of Israel had split into two nations. Uh, in the north was the nation of Israel, and this uh, retained 12, uh, excuse me, 10 of the 12 tribes, 
And uh, they retained the name Israel. And in the south was the kingdom of Judah. Uh, named Judah because that was the dominant tribe in, in, that, in, in that part. Now, both of these nations are struggling to live faithfully for the Lord. They are both God's people. Right? God's promises have been extended to both of them. And they're both struggling to be faithful in, in their commitment to the Lord. They're, they're caught up in idolatry, the, the worship of false gods. Sexual immorality is widespread. And, and as a culture, they are oppressing the poor and they're failing to live out their calling as God's chosen people. Right? That, that's where God's people are in this time in their history. And to illustrate the role of the prophets, I, I want to show you a graphic. Now, I had Matt create this, and he did uh, just a great job on it. And I had him create it because I wanted to remind us of a few things. And so this graphic it is right there in your notes because I want you to be able to refer back to it. Uh, the first thing that this graphic reminds us of is that the, each of the prophets was a warning sign sent from God. God's people were on the wrong road. They were, they were on this road towards judgment. They were on this road towards destruction. And so the, each of these prophets is, is a warning sign beckoning God's people to turn around. See, this, this is the thing. God was about to lift his protective hand over the nation of Israel and Judah. Right? They, they were going to experience judgment at the hands of, of other nations. And this judgment was going to come first at the hands of Assyria. And Assyria would come down and just destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. And they're going to push all the way into the southern kingdom of Israel and bring it to the brink of its collapse. And after the threat of Assyria, well, there's going to be another threat. The threat of the Babylonians. And they're going to persecute the nation of Judah again. Right? The prophet's message to the people uh, was threefold. The, the first part was there was this warning uh, of coming judgment, that, that God's people needed to repent because judgment was coming. And then there's that, that admonishment to repent, that, that if they repented, God could still redeem them. God could still work with them. And then finally, there is a prediction of, of future hope. Now, this is the significance about the, the future hope here. It, it was significant that each of these prophets gave this picture of future hope because God wasn't going to leave his people in judgment, right? God wasn't seeking to just uh, judge them and leave them there for all time. God gives them this picture of hope along with this warning that he is still active in their history. He's still active in their, their life. He's still working for their benefit. And so overwhelmingly, the, the message of the prophets, it was a downer, right? It, it was hard to hear, and, and the people were resistant to it. Uh, we, I entitled this series uh, Grumpy Old Men because that's exactly how these prophets were viewed, right? The, the people uh, of Israel and Judah, they didn't hold them in high regard. They didn't, uh, they didn't respect them. They, they, they saw them as a nuisance, as a burden, Right? The, the prophets were proclaiming an unpopular message while the people of Israel and Judah were living the dream. Right? They were prospering. They, they were independent and, and, and free. And they didn't want to hear what the prophets had to say. And so the prophets had this discouraging and frustrating mission because the people of Israel and Judah, their hearts were hardened and they just wouldn't listen. And the result, uh, as a result, God's people end up facing judgment at the hands of the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And there is nothing the prophets can do about it. The first prophet that we're going to be looking at is the prophet of Joel. Now, Joel is a difficult prophet to place historically. Some think he's at the beginning of this time period. Others would place him at the end. Uh, I chose to use him at the beginning because... Why not? <laughs> we had to start somewhere. And so we're starting with Joel. If you have your Bible or an electronic device with the Bible app, I want to encourage you to open up to the book of Joel. If you have to use your table of contents, there's no shame in that. <laughs> they put that in the front of your Bible for a reason. Uh, so feel free to, to use that and look that up. Uh, Joel is a short book. It's just three chapters, a total of four pages in my Bible. And those four pages, and in those four pages, it hits that three-part structure that we talked about perfectly. The opening chapter starts with a warning of coming judgment. 
And then there's a, a call to repent. And finally, there's a picture of hope. Right? God hasn't given up on his people. He's still motivated by love for them. Now, the picture of hope that we see in Joel is interesting because it's hard to place. It's not linear. Uh, sometimes we look for that. We want God to kind of give his revelation in, in this linear pattern where it just follows the linear flow of time. And, and that's not what we see in, in Joel. Right? In the, when it comes to the future hope, uh, Joel offers the readers just these scattered glimpses of, of what God's going to do in the future. And so when we read the, the final chapter of jo Joel and we see the, the, uh, the future hope that's present, we see each of those destination signs that we saw in the graphic represented, right? It, Joel talks about their return from exile and the restoration into the land. Now keep in mind, this is before the exile even happens. And so he tells them, hey, this army's coming. This, <laughs> these, these adversaries are, are, are coming and, and they're going to uh, oppress you, but there's hope because God's going to bring you back to this land. God's going to restore you. And then he goes on, he talks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church on the day of Pentecost. And finally, he talks about a messianic king and the judgment of the nations. Joel covers a mind-blowing amount of ground in just three short chapters. And so for us, the modern reader, the book of Joel is a glimpse of how God leads his people, how he interacts in the lives of his people. Our God is loving. He's good. He's gracious and forgiving. But he cannot, and he will not, tolerate sin. That, that is the message of, of Joel. The sin of this world is going to be judged. I, I know sometimes we kind of hang our heads almost hopeless because we see sin advancing in, in our culture, in our world. It fills us with dread and, and loathing. The sin of this world, it, it will be judged. That day is coming. It is inevitable. Likewise, the message of Joel is that the sin in the lives of God's people is going to be disciplined. Not, not because God wants to e exert some sort of retribution from us, but rather he wants to give us victory from our sin. Amen. And so we have been invited in, into this incredible relationship with God where he leads us through this process of life transformation. And then as we experience that life transformation, we are blessed in that we have this incredible relationship, this opportunity to know God personally. But along with that blessing comes God's discipline. Right? As we follow God, there are going to be times when, when that transformation process is going to require that God discipline us as, as his children. And so Joel offers a warning that judgment is coming to God's people. The imagery that Joel uses is that of a swarm of locusts that, that just devours the land, right? Just comes in wave after wave after wave. And that, this, that the, those locusts, they represent the armies of Assyria coming to destroy the nation of Israel and Judah. Now, in the north, they will be destroyed and the people dispersed and those 10 tribes are going to lose their identity as, as a people, uh, sometimes occasionally you hear somebody talk about the, the ten lost tribes of Israel. This is what they're talking about. They're talking about the nation of Israel. When Assyria comes in, they, they conquer them and they just disperse the people and, and they're lost. Their identity is no more. And when Assyria comes in, they push south and they conquer much of Judah. And they end up putting the, the city of Jerusalem under siege. And it's there. When Judah is on the brink of defeat, when they are facing the exact same fate as Israel, that King Hezekiah finally humbles himself and falls to his knees in prayer and begs the Lord to deliver him, and God shows up. God shows up and wipes out over 100,000 Assyrian troops. You can find that story in 2 Kings 17 through 19. It's an incredible story. And I, for our text today, I want to read just a sample of the description that Joel gives of this, this judgment that's coming. As we read this text, I want you to make note that Joel is speaking in poetry. This is really vivid imagery. And that has an advantage in that it's, it's really easy for us to remember. 
But at times, it's hard for us to relate to. It's hard for us to know exactly what he means. And so, Joel 1, or verse 2, this is what it says. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children. And let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my, la my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion and the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Now this text is a picture of destruction. This army is going to swoop in like a plague of locusts and they're going to leave nothing in, in their wake. Just destruction for the nation of Israel. They are going to decimate the wealth of God's people and God's people are going to be left wounded and vulnerable. The point of this vivid warning is this. Sin brings consequences. Right? Sin brings consequences. And as I say that, I want to remind us that our God is good. Right? Our God is patient. And I'm grateful that, that he is gracious. I'm grateful that he doesn't deal with us harshly or, or dole out the punishments that, that our sinfulness warrants. But unfortunately, God's goodness, his gracious nature... Right, these traits of God that, that, that make him worthy of our worship, oftentimes they, they're abused. Right? Rather than God's graciousness inspiring us towards life change, oftentimes they're abused and used as a license for sin. When facing temptation or a moral dilemma, it's tempting to say, oh, it's okay. God will forgive me. Right? This is what's going on in both the nation of Israel and Judah at this time. God has blessed them with wealth and security. And in the midst of this blessing, they're, they're focused their attention on sin. Right? They've forgotten that sin has consequences. Sin leads to death. Romans 6.23 says this. It says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, our God is good. Right? Like, like a loving father, he often gives us what we need. He often blesses us in advance. Right? He doesn't wait for us to earn it or to deserve it. He, just, he often blesses us in advance. And, and he invites us right, to, to follow him out of gratitude and love. This is how our relationship with God is intended to work. He provides, and we follow. E even in times of hardship, right? When we have to go through the difficult things in life, God is present, providing, and, and leading. And we can come to trust him more and more, right? Our love for God in those hard times should grow deeper and deeper. But unfortunately, we don't always like to follow, Right? This is exactly where Israel and Judah are at. They, they have God's blessing, right? But they don't want to follow him. They, they want God to bless them, but they don't want to, to live their lives based off his word. And so, how often do we make the same mistake? Right? We want God to bless us, we, but we also want to call the shots. And so, we compromise. Sometimes this is out of ignorance. Sometimes we compromise because we don't know the truth, right? We, we haven't been taught. Or, or we, we, we aren't studying God's word and applying it to our lives. And so we, we compromise simply because we're ignorant of, of what the truth is. But then there are other times when we compromise freely. Like we know what God wants from us. We know what he would have from us. But we choose sin instead. Oftentimes when we do this, we console ourselves with the idea that our sin isn't a big deal. It's just, it's just a little sin, right? It's just, just, a, just a little compromise. 
But we fail to remember that sin brings death. Sin has consequences, and, and what, what often smart starts as a, a small little sin has a tendency to grow in our lives until it brings about our destruction. The Apostle James says it this way. He says, then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Sin grows, and when it's full grown, it brings death. How many addictions have started with, with the statement, oh, it's just one more drink? How, how many relationships have been broken because a, a teeny seed of resentment was allowed to grow and, and to take root? How many marriages have been destroyed because pride and hurt have pushed out love? How many young girls are trafficked and humiliated and dehumanized because good people click on that website? How much death and suffering has the mantra, that's mine, me first, unleashed on this world? How many times has the choice to stay just a little later ended in sexual immorality and unfaithfulness? See, it always feels like it's just a, a little bit of compromise. But those little compromises, they grow. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Listen to this news story. I found this online. And this is what it says. It says, 37-year-old Kelly had three unusual pets. A Bengal tire, an African lion, and a black bear. And while they were kept in a separate cages, she was mauled to death one fine day by her black bear while she was cleaning his cage. First of all, that doesn't sound like one fine day. <laughs> but I didn't write it. Uh, she had given him some dog food and then turned her back on it when he attacked and fatally wounded her. Na neighbors witnessed the attack and called authorities, but it was too late. Now, I read that story to you because I think oftentimes that could be the headline for, for many Christians. Right? Sin is like that caged bear. We think we're in control. And then when we turn our back on it, it, it gets us. Right? It, it destroys us. And, and all the while, while, while sin is destroying us, our loved ones, they, they, they can just helplessly watch. H have you been there? Have you, have you seen that play out in the lives of people you love where you would desperately save them from that? But you can't. And you watch them just get mauled by their own bad decisions. Now, now we often frame our sin as innocent. It, it's, it's someone else's fault. If, if people only knew the stress that I was under, they would understand my choices. It can't be helped because of this or that. It's all just excuses, just nonsense. All the while, God, is, or excuse me, all the while, our sin is destroying us. Amen. I, I got another picture for you. Take a look at this guy. Now, I'm willing to bet that he knows I'm sorry it's grainy, but it's a great picture. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that he knows he's making a, a wrong choice. Right? I, I'm sure that he knows that, that what he's doing isn't a wise move, but he thinks he's in control. Right? He thinks that he can't get hurt. He, he's having fun in the moment. You know, he, he, at the end of this, he's going to have a great story to tell and, and a, a selfie to boot, Right? And so he thinks that this is worth the risk. He thinks he's in control. Show the next picture. Oh. <laughs> now, I don't know if this picture is real. I certainly hope not. <laughs> but it's a perfect illustration, uh, a perfect illustration of how sin gets us. Right? We think we have it under control, but sin has consequences. And when they catch us, they're often devastating and unstoppable. And so sin has consequences. I know our world doesn't live like it. I know that it's an unpopular thing to point out, even in the church. I mean, you want to make friends? Just, point, just go around pointing out people's, the consequences to their sin. They'll love you for it. Right? It is an unpopular message. But it's ironic because everyone can see that A leads to B, right? The consequences of sin, it's not rocket science. We see it play out in people's lives all around us. 
And, and it's a shame that, that, that we're unwilling to address it because God has called us to bear each other's burdens in that way. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not encouraging you to go around and to make that your mission, right? I'm going to go around, I'm going to call out everybody's sin, right? That, that's not what I'm calling you to, but I will tell you this, that it is an incredible gift when two brothers or two sisters, in mutual respect with one another, choose to call out each other's sin, to point out the consequences that they're facing because of their sinful attitudes and, and actions. That is a beautiful, beautiful gift. And it is what God is calling us to as brothers and sisters. That we would authentically pursue him in such a way that we could be vulnerable with each other and that we could be real with each other, calling each other to address our sin. Sin has consequences. And if we're going to reject God's way for our own, it's only a matter of time before those consequences catch up with us. When it does, it's, it's painful. And it's not because God wants to exert some sort of retribution. No, God is seeking to, to bring victory. We, we forget that we picked up the bear cub. Right? We thought that selfie was a good idea. And often the, the pain that we experience in the consequences of sin is often just a natural consequence uh, of our bad decision making. And so for most of us, we know this. Right? I'm not telling you anything that you don't know is true. It's something that you wouldn't have been able to share yourselves. But this is the reality. When we are caught in the moment, we, always, we often have the same mentality. We think that we can somehow dodge the consequences of sin. Or we think that, that we can just plow through those consequences and, and it will be all right. But it's never all right. Sin always breeds brokenness. It always brings hurt in, into this world. And so it's incredible to me how, how we have normalized the brokenness of, of this world. The, the consequences of sin, again, are playing out all around us. We see them in the lives of the people that we love and we normalize their hurt. We, we begin to believe the lie that, you know what, that's just the way it is. Right? It just, this is the way it is. There's, there's nothing that can be done about it. And we forget that God has called us to a better way. He's offering us a better way. The lives of God's people do not have to look like the broken, messed up lives of the world. Man, our marriages, they can look different Right? Our, our bonds as, as friends and as brothers, they can look different. We don't have to follow the pattern of this world. God has called us to something more, something different. This is exactly where the people of, of Israel are at. Right? They, they have compromised. And they, they have the word of God telling them how to live. They have the warnings from the prophets, but they have come to a place where they refuse to believe that those things apply to them. And so they are living in prosperity. They are living in security. And they are sinning. They are rejecting God. Joel, he, he goes on and he admonishes the people to turn back to God. This is chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Joel says, he says, rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Now there's so much in those two short verses. But, but the first thing I want to point out is he says, rend your hearts and not your garments. Now, to rend means to, to tear something apart, to, to tear it into pieces. And in this culture, it was common for them to express grief and, and mourning by ripping their outer garments. And so Joel is saying here, he's saying, hey, don't, don't rip your garments, rip your heart. Right? The grief and, and the, the, the hurt from your sin, it needs to penetrate all the way down into your heart so your heart is broken. This is an incredible picture of repentance. And that repentance, it just can't be on the outside. It has to be internal. And I want you to grab hold of this. I believe that's one of the things that marks God's people. God's people are marked by a deep, deep grief over their sin. 
Now understand, I don't think this means that we wallow in self-loathing, right? This isn't that we, we hold on to our grief and, and allow it to, to rob us of the victory that Christ gives us. But, but that's, that's the difference between God's people and the rest of the world. Our sin, it bothers us. Right? Because we've seen the character and the goodness of God. And, and, and when we fall short of that, it breaks our hearts. And when it breaks our hearts, that's when God can come in and he can start to do a work. And so repentance, it needs to be authentic and not just symbolic. Understand that repentance, it doesn't... It does, if Israel was to repent at this point, it doesn't mean that the consequences are going to go away. At least there's no guarantee of that. Right? From what Joel is saying, it seems like that army, it's coming. Right? That army, it, it's on its way. God's people will experience the consequences of their sin, but that repentance can change the effect that those consequences have on them. The same is true for us. We can't turn back time. We, we can't undo the mistakes that we've made, but we can face the consequences of those mistakes in a way that brings about a spiritual reset. We may not be able to avoid the consequences, but we can endure them faithfully. Now, authentic repentance, it starts with an honest admission that, that I was wrong. Right? We, we have to admit that to ourselves. We have to admit that to God. We have to admit that to each other. And then we need to go and we need to make right whatever it is that we can, can right, make right to the extent that we can correct it. And so that means if, if we've been dishonest, we need to go and tell the truth. If we've stolen, well, we need to go and pay the full price. If a relationship has been strained or broken, we need to humbly go and seek the, rest, the, the healing of that relationship. If our sin is hidden, we need to bring it to the light. Now, this road of repentance that I'm describing here, that's a pretty terrifying road. That can be a hard, hard road. In fact, uh, sometimes that act of repentance, traveling that road, it will in and of itself trigger consequences that we then have to face. But that process also comes with hope. And, and that's, that's the carrot that we chase after. That's, that's what makes it worthwhile is we embrace this road of repentance because we're trusting that God's going to work through it. Whether consequences come or not, we're trusting that God is going to change us. And so listen to what Joel had to say again. This is the same text that we read before. It says, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. And what I'm telling you is this, that, that I can't guarantee you that if you repent of your sin that you won't face consequences. I can't give you that guarantee. But I can give you this guarantee. If you face those consequences with faith, God's going to leave a blessing. Right? God's going to leave us transformed and changed, and that's what we put our hope in. We don't leave our hope in the fact that, that we are somehow going to avoid the, the, the consequences of our sin. Our hope is in the fact that God's going to work in the midst of those consequences. And so when we turn to the Lord, he fights for us. He doesn't dole out punishment for, for the sake of retribution. I've said that four times now. I hope you get that. <laughs> right? He, he only disciplines us for our growth and for our benefit. And if we're willing to turn back to him, he will embrace us. God fights for us. Marriages can be restored. Addictions can be re defeated. Relationships can be healed. Divisions can be unified. On our own, none of that is possible. I don't care how good you are, how insightful you are. We can't do that on our own. But with God, all of that is possible. And so the question is, do we have the courage and the humility to follow God through that process of repentance? Will we follow him through that process of life transformation? If we do... God's going to lend him, us his strength and we will win the victory. But we have to follow him there. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I come before you grateful of your goodness. Lord, we are grateful that, that you often bless us before we have 
It's not often. You have consistently blessed us before we deserved it. And Lord, I just pray that, that we would have the courage to, to follow you through the process of repentance. That, Lord, that we would first of all have insight into our lives as to where we are compromising and, and where we are allowing sin to grow. And Lord, I pray that, that as individuals that we would chase after you. As a congregation, Lord, I pray that we would chase after you and that, that we would uh, see a, a transformation happening in our midst. Lord, we recognize that none of that is possible on our own. We need you. And so give us the courage uh, to face whatever consequences we, we need. And Lord, we pray that we just see your hand at work through it all. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We are now uh, come to our, our time of communion. And we are switching back to passing the communion trays. And uh, th this is how this is going to work today. Uh, we are going to pass the communion trays, and, and what you'll find is the cups, we're still doing the two-cup method. Uh, there'll be bread in the bottom cup, uh, uh, juice in the top cup. And what we want you to do with that is just take the cup and then pass the tray. And, and then on your own, take communion when you're ready. And when you are finished, stack those two cups together. And in the front of your chair, there's a little ring. It's made for this purpose. Just, just place that cup uh, right in that ring and we will, we will catch those later. Um, and so, with that said, I, I want to go back to a scripture that we looked at in, in the middle of this lesson. It's Romans 6.23. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the bottom line for, for today's message is this, that, that sin brings death, but God offers us life. Right? That's a, it's amazing to me that we even struggle with that choice. Sin brings death, but God offers us life. And that life, it comes with a price. It comes with the price of his son. Taking, you know, making the sacrifice, taking the pain, taking the, 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 the destructiveness of sin, taking that all on himself so that we could have a, a different choice. And so as we've come to communion, I want us to focus on that.